It is two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Um, my name is Anthony Karifa Rogers Wright, and I'm just very, very happy and very excited for this incredible discussion that we are about to have. The session is Climate Change and COVID-19, What the Pandemic Teaches Us About Preparing for Disaster. Um, I get to moderate and be an incredible fan of these brilliant women, friends, teachers, confidants, who I've been in the trenches with for, for some years now. So I'm very excited to introduce them in a moment. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a national uh, racial and climate justice advocate and practitioner. I have the honor of uh, serving the Climate Justice Alliance as their policy coordinator and Green New Deal lead. And I also have the honor of serving on the board of directors for Friends of the Earth, Center for Sustainable Economy in the Backbone Campaign. That all said, um, I have to say from the onset um, that while I have the support of these amazing organizations, today I will be speaking for myself and the opinions of this panel do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations um, that were aforementioned. Um, that said, um, I just wanna give you a quick uh, rundown of what we're gonna be doing today. Um, I'll offer some quick, quick remarks. I will then um, introduce these um, amazing people who will be joining me momentarily. And then we're gonna uh, go through an incredible discussion. Um, we're gonna break it down into three parts. One, the problem definition. We're gonna be talking about the root causes of both the climate crisis and the COVID pandemic. The second, then we'll get into what is perpetuating um, these, these crises that are uh, particularly affecting black, brown, indigenous people, poor white folk, Asians, and those who we say are on the front line of these crises. And then the uh, final part that we'll discuss before some Q&A, we'll be talking about why it's important to scale up and scale out the solutions that are coming from these communities. So um, to uh, get started, um, you know, the pundits, talking heads, lawmakers, and many others refer to these times as unprecedented. And while these characterizations may be warranted, for those of us who fight and struggle from and on the front lines, while banal may not be the right word, there is something rather nominal about this moment. Black, brown, and indigenous people have proven to be the most resilient beings in the her story of this world, vindicating the sage words of the prophet Audre Lorde, who once wrote, quote, for to survive in the mouth of this dragon we call America, we have had to learn this first and most vital lesson, that we were never meant to survive, not as human beings. The four C's, not to be confused with the C4s, coming at our people at this time with interlinked ferocity, capitalism, cops, climate change, and COVID must not be viewed as anomalies, but variables of an iniquitous, draconian, and long-standing system. So to those who say the system isn't working or the system is rigged, I would invite you to subject yourself to massive and intentional cogitation. Because it's not that the system isn't working. The system is working exactly as it was designed to. And it's not that the system is rigged as much as rigging is a part of the system. As with all systems, there are benefactor extractors and those they extract from daily, monthly, yearly, and for centuries. In the context of the US settler colonial experiment, it's the front lines, the people, the workers, and their communities who have been determined to be sacrificial. And it is for this reason that many of us understand that while COVID may be a pandemic, at its root, it is just a symptom of a larger disease forged by white supremacy, patriarchy, and colonization. These are the root causes of all of the intersecting crises coming for our people. And until we collectively demonstrate an articulation of this fact, all of our proposed solutions will be perfunctory and specious. The lexicon of the climate community includes phrases like adaptation, resilience, and preparedness. But I would ask an adaptation of what, and resilience to what, and preparedness for what? Indigenous people may not have been prepared for genocide and brutal land theft, and African people may not have been prepared for the pillage of bodies, forced labor, including forced fecundity of African women, but both these people have proven to be more than resilient. And it's through this resilience that we refuse to adapt to white supremacy, patriarchy, and colonization when the solution is to dismantle and eviscerate these pillars of malevolence once and for all. Perhaps this is why, as the front lines, we know that our solutions are the ones that must be scaled up and scaled out. It makes me wonder who really needs to adapt. Those that are coming up with real solutions are those that are peddling proverbial magic beans like cap and trade, net zero emissions, carbon offsets, and industrial carbon capture and storage. Me, I'll take just transition, just recovery, energy democracy, and food sovereignty for 500 Alex. And these sisters are about to tell you all why I've come to this conclusion long ago. So when we ask ourselves, what is the mission? What needs to be done now? We must simultaneously understand that we've been here before as a country. After all, the story of the United States is a collection of crossroads that have seen this settler colonial thesis take baby steps towards the right direction, only to witness a massive inertia shoving uh, the back through white supremacy, the body back of justice, 20 steps, 100 paces, and the ultimate goal of forcing it back to as close to 400 years ago as possible. I'll close by saying this, 
There are many questions orbiting our social universe of social media, Zoom meetings, Google Hangouts, and the more recently seldom face-to-face -face discussions that we are affording as we attempt to stay and keep our loved ones safe and healthy. The overarching question I have, and that I will be asking these amazing women momentarily, is, is this just another moment or the prelude to a perpetual momentum? Franz Fanon offered an answer to this question with a challenge when he wrote in 1961, quote, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. So thank you again. And with that, I'm going to do a quick introduction of these um, amazing people. And then I'm going to turn it over to them to um, introduce themselves for about two to three minutes. And then we're going to get into the discussion. So first, I am so blessed and honored to introduce you to Catherine Coleman Flowers, who has been such a good friend of mine for the last four or five years and even an adopted mother. She is um, a rural development manager for the Equal Justice Initiative and the founder of the Center for Rural Enterprises and Environmental Justice. In addition, she serves as a Duke University Franklin Humanities Institute practitioner in residence. Her goal is to find solutions to the lack of sanitation in many parts of rural America that rival conditions found in the developing world. She has characterized this as America's dirty secret. Her new book, which we are all in anticipation for, comes out November 17th, and it's called Waste, One Woman's Fight Against America's Dirty Secret. In this book, uh, Ms. Kathy explores how so many rural low-income communities across the United States do not have access to basic sanitation, and she explains how systemic racism and prejudice hurt vulnerable communities in areas all over the country. By the way, that book is available for pre-order at thenewpress.com. So Ms. Kathy, I'm gonna turn it to you now for about three minutes to just introduce yourself quickly, your work, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Anthony, for inviting me, and I'm, I'm glad to be part of the, the Net Roots Nation, which I have been hearing so much about for, very, so, for so very long, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I think that um, this is a moment that is, is very important, at least in terms of my work and the work of the other sisters that share the panel with me. Uh, I think we're at the point where we see, where we're seeing firsthand what happens when we ignore a problem, be it climate change or COVID, it gets worse. And COVID has shown us if for no other reason, uh, if we don't put some things in place, we're gonna suffer and the people on the front lines are suffering first uh, and hard. Uh, today, Lowndes County, Alabama, which is located between Selma and Montgomery, which is where I do a lot of my work, and I'm also a native of Lowndes County, has uh, I, the most recent press I've read has the, the highest per capita infection rate of COVID in the state of Alabama, and it also has the highest per capita uh, death rate in the state of Alabama. And if you look at Lowndes County's history, which I can't go into a lot of today, but if you read Hassan Jeffrey's Bloody Lowndes, uh, it will give you some indication of why we are where we are right now. Thank you so much, Ms. Kathy. Um, next, I am blessed to introduce my sister in struggle, um, friend, confidant, um, we have thrown down together in Standing Rock, Minneapolis, all across the country. Uh, my good friend, Tara Hauska, founder of the Genu Collective and a former advisor on Native American affairs to uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, then candidate Bernie Sanders. She spent six months on the front lines fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline and is currently engaged in the, mo uh, the movement to defund fossil fuels and the year-long struggle against Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline in Minnesota. She's a co-founder of Not Your Mascots, and big congratulations on that, Tara. Congratulations, like amazing work, and she, uh, which was a, a group committed to uh, positive representation of Native people. She's a TED speaker, gave a Harvard keynote, received an awesome woman award from Linda Gates, and a Rachel Network Catalyst Award, is featured in Women, A Century of Change by National Geographic, and was named an icon on the cover of Outside Magazine's 40th anniversary edition. Tara has contributed to the New York Times, The Guardian, Huffington Post, Indian Country Today, and has been featured on CNN, MSNBC, CBS, Democracy Now! and BBC. She lives in a pipeline resistance camp in northern Minnesota with an incredible dog and a cat named Pipeline Pete. <laughs> Tara, it is so good to see you. Thank you for, for blessing us with your time. I know like you're in the trenches. And um, um, I, don't, I don't know how you can top that introduction, my sister, but um, two minutes just to introduce yourself quickly and in your incredible work. Uh, thanks for that. And thanks for the shout out to the pets. The frontline pets are so critical to maintaining our our, uh, our sanity on these front lines. Uh, my name is Tara Hauska in Bear Clan. 
from Kuchiting First Nation. I'm Anishinaabe calling in from Anishinaabe homelands. Um, about 200 yards off the proposed Line 3 route where I've been living for the last two years. Um, out, out, in the, out in the ground and out in the woods and you know, doing all the things that we need to do to draw awareness to um, both the struggle to protect Mother Earth, but also to elevate and uplift um, those land defenders around the world because we are in this such a critical moment um, of recognizing that the indigenous peoples of this world have something to offer when it comes to living in balance with the earth. We have something to offer when it comes to living in balance with each other, living in respect and um, empathy towards one another. Um, and I, I would say that to me, it's not just 400 years, it's 528 years since, since Columbus landed. Um, actually not in North America, but whatever, you know, um, until the genocide of, of this particular region began. So I'm honored to be here with all of you. Looking forward to the panel and uh, miigwech, especially to Anthony for always holding it down and always bringing together such uh, beautiful voices and people. Miigwech. Thank you, sis. Thank you so much. Well, um, next, I'm so pleased to um, introduce um, a sister who I only met last summer, but it feels like she has been with me in struggle my entire life. Um, Michelle Martinez, a Latinx um, environmental justice activist, born and raised in the Motor City, Detroit, the D, and raised um, in the Latinx uh, diaspora. Since 2006, she's worked in a, a local communities of color to build power, halt climate change, and the detrimental effects of pollution in post-industrial Detroit. Working across issues of race, gender, and nationality, she has built and led coalitions using art, media, land-based programming, popular education, voter engagement, and corporate accountability tactics to shape policy solutions. In 2019, she helped organize over 2,000 people in the March for a Green New Deal in Detroit, Michigan during the Democratic National Debate. I took part in that with the sister. It was an incredible, absolutely incredible opportunity. And we'll talk more about what happened in the debate in a second. Um, currently, uh, Sister Michelle is the statewide coordinator for the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, a proud Climate Justice Alliance member, which advocates for climate justice for communities disproportionately impacted by environmental toxins. Her consulting work through Third Horizon Consulting focuses on primarily on justice and equity in the environmental movement through storytelling, strategic planning, and collective decision making. In 2017, she was an equity fellow at Wayne State University's uh, Law School, uh, Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights, and received the top 25 Latinx leaders from the state of Michigan, Hispanic Latino Commission in 2019. She earned her Master's of Science in Environmental Policy from the University of Michigan, uh, School of Natural Resources and Environment. Got to give a shout out to Dr. Dorcia Taylor real quick while I'm saying that. And um, I'm now an SEAS and BA in English Literature also from the University of Michigan. Sister Michelle, welcome. Thank you so much. I know you're holding down so much in the D right now. So thank you so much for blessing um, us with your time and your wisdom. And uh, the floor is yours for two minutes. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you all to all the speakers for everything that you do every day. I'm so humbled to be amongst giants and want to pay homage not only to you, but to uh, the shoulders upon which we stand, uh, giants in the environmental justice world who have created this moment for us. Uh, it's the 25th anniversary in the state of Michigan of the first EJ Summit hosted by Dr. Bunyan Bryan and Dr. Paul Mohai, again at the University of Michigan. Uh, we have EJ leaders and, and earth warriors who have been doing this for so many years, so many generations. So I'm so pleased to be a part of this and shout out to the 313 Detroiters who are on the, on the line here and holding it down. Uh, what I say for environmental justice is that we're a family and we're a flock and we move together as a part of our governance structure. And the way that we hope to move together is by building consensus and building our voice. And while we might disagree, the disagreement actually makes our movement more robust. It makes our arguments cleaner, faster, sharper, and it makes our political movements grow. So thank you again for being able to provide the space for us to dialogue through what is the most challenging time uh, right now for so many families uh, in Detroit who have lost loved ones through the COVID crisis at an astronomical rate compared to the rest of the state and under such dire economic conditions. So lifting up the people who have passed in this crisis and our ancestors who have made the way for us to have the power of voice today. 
Thank you so much, Michelle. Well, um, last but damn sure not least, um, I'm, I'm so honored and humbled to introduce my sister, mentor, and teacher, and good friend, uh, Jacqueline Patterson who serves as the Senior Director of the NAACP Environment and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, Sister Jackie has served as coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. Jackie Patterson has also worked as a researcher, program manager, um, um, coordinator, advocate, and activist working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. She serves as a Senior Women's Rights Policy Analyst for ActionAid, where she integrated a woman's rights lens for the issues of food, macroeconomics, and climate change, as well as the intersection of violence against women and HIV AIDS. Previously, she served as Assistant Vice President of HIV AIDS programs for IMA World Health, providing management and technical assistance to medical facilities and programs in 23 countries on the, in the motherland, Africa, and the Caribbean. Patterson uh, also served as the Outreach Project Associate for the Center of Budget and P uh, Policy Priorities and Research Coordinator for Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. She's also served as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica and in the West Indies. Holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Maryland, big up Terrapins, and a master's degree in public health from uh, Johns Hopkins University. I think those are the Blue Jays. She, <clears throat> she currently serves um, on the steering committee for Interfaith Moral Action on Climate as the advisory board for Center for Earth Essex, as well as, as on the board of directors for the Institute of the Black World, the Hive Gender and Climate Justice Fund, the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, Greenpeace, Bill Anderson Fund, People Solar Energy Fund, and the National Black Workers Center Project. Welcome, Sister Jackie. Thank you so much for, for blessing us with your time. It's so always such an honor and a pleasure to see you. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you all. And yeah, so my name is Jackie. I am really just thrilled to be with such great sisters on this panel and coordinated by the ever awesome brother, Anthony. Um, yeah, the work that we do at the Environmental and Climate Justice Program at the NAACP is really increasingly about sovereignty and self-determination. We've seen how the the us coming over into this nation as as black folks as and as African American folks in particular have come over in as the in the holes of ships as, as our ancestors have as cargo and really became the we're taken away from our foundation and our generational wealth to become someone else's assets and someone else's generational wealth and we see where that has led us in terms of our the dehumanized state where it brings us to this point where you have someone uh, having being having their their murder televised with the the boot of someone on their <clears throat> And so we recognize that if we can't continue to just chip away at a, at a fundamentally flawed system um, that we're, that we're um, toiling under. And we recognize that true transformation is, is what's needed. And so the work that we do is around how do we, how do we link arms with folks um, who are moving this amazing work on this panel and beyond to, to, sh to shift our systems, to shift our systems so that we aren't having the same situation over and over again, whether it's COVID-19, climate change, or other shocks to our system, we're always kind of in the same position. On March the 9th, I wrote this document called the 10 Equity Implications of the COVID-19 Pandemic. And that was March the 9th before any of this stuff really truly started to unfold, but that's because we all know, any of us could have written that because we all know what the systemic inequities are and what the eventual outcome of those systems. So it looked prophet prophetic when we look at today and what it predicted then, but it really was common sense for anyone who's on the front lines of this movement. So super excited to be having this conversation about the true systemic changes that we need so that to prevent those types of situations from happening going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Much, Sister Jackie. Well, we're gonna we're gonna dive right in because um, uh, we're gonna build off the problem definition that we were talking about. So, uh, my question to all of you, and then I'm gonna follow up with individual questions to each of you. But you all have nuanced uh, yet aligned understandings that we must tackle and eviscerate the root causes of the climate crisis, which I uh, named earlier: white supremacy, patriarchy, colonization, uh, COVID, um, in all of the communities you, uh, you all represent and are accountable to, um, is a pernicious amplifier, elucidator, and magnifier of existing 
injustices, including environmental racism. And I'm wondering and hoping that each of you can explain how this has been showing up in your community specifically, as well as from a macro viewpoint uh, for all frontline and fenceline communities. I'd love to start with uh, you, Ms. Kathy, um, 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 being that you are, 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 are representing um, one of a, 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 a region of our country that some, some have referred to as uh, the premier sacrifice zone for, for this nation. You, you, you also um, address some of the history, but what, like, what is this moment looking like right now um, in, in Bama and Lowndes County and, and Montgomery? I think uh, what this moment is doing, uh, especially with COVID, COVID, I've described it, described it as a heat seeking missile that has sought out and is magnifying the inequities that exist, not just in the South and Lowndes County and Alabama, but throughout this nation. And we're seeing it. Uh, we're seeing how uh, we have built a system uh, based on the labor of people that are not valued. So they're being forced to go to work uh, and having to sign waivers that they can't sue the companies if they get COVID. And a lot of the people that we know are getting sick from COVID and have died from COVID here in this area have died on these so-called essential jobs, but they don't pay them an essential salary where they can have a decent standard of living. So uh, it has been a moment in which if we thought that we had solved some of these problems, the systemic problems that exist in terms of the way this economy is structured and also in terms of uh, the racial inequities that have been a part of our system have, have been really, uh, they, they, they've been amplified in such a way that they cannot be ignored. Uh, to hear local legislators say things like $600 a week is too much money for someone to get uh, for unemployment, when in fact, you know, you need far more than that. And before they had the uh, $600 a week, they were only getting $245 a week. So if you add it all up, it's still not enough money for them to go and, and and become sacrificed because now this we you know we talked about sacrifice zones in terms of big areas, but now the sacrifices are being made by individuals who have to put their children in in, in schools that were underfunded in the first place, and they're being told that if your children don't go to school, then we're gonna the public monies that it was receiving are going to be misdirected to private schools, which is happening. And on the other hand, the, the parents are being forced to work. And the question is, in a state that would not expand medical care for all, what does it mean when the children are getting sick and the parents are getting sick and they cannot support their families? So this is um, what we're seeing here. Uh, and I think that this is probably being seen and being repeated all around the nation where there's no uniform effort to address COVID. And, a lot, and I think we're gonna see even more suffering. Uh, more suffering, and, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we're gonna see a lot of people that can't feed their families, not just because of COVID, but because the system was unequal in the first place. And now when you add illness to that, uh, and they're being forced to potentially go to work and get sick. We've had, in Lowndes County, we've had um, a father and daughter to die. The father died first, and a few weeks later, the daughter died. Uh, one of the persons that you've met, Pamela Rush, uh, you actually went to her home on July 3rd. Pamela Rush passed away because of COVID. She had just turned 50 and she left two children. So we are seeing it and feeling it firsthand. And a lot of people uh, still, I think, are choosing to be in denial about what is happening because they feel just powerless to do anything about it. But I think that we have to keep fighting. This is that moment. Thank you, Ms. Kathy. I want to uh, turn to you now, uh, Tara, because, um, you know, you uh, recently returned back to your camp from um, uh, the Navajo uh, people. Um, and, and when we're talking about, you know, some existing crises that existed um, well, well before COVID, um, for instance, um, you know, in 2016, when I had the opportunity to um, uh, do a testimony to the DNC platform committee. You know, everyone was talking about Flint, rightfully so, but the water crises um, with the Diné people and the Navajo people from, you know, uh, years of, of uranium mining, um, their water systems, or lack thereof, it was extremely perilous. You, uh, doing what you always do, um, 
recently drove down with a whole bunch of supplies. And I remember you just talking about the, the, the situation on the ground there. And I'm wondering if you can share that with the, um, with the folks who are, um, you know, in this, um, in this chat room now and, and, and from the context of like what was already existing and how dire the situation um, was there when you were just recently there. Yeah, you know, I can start off by saying, you know, I think that Native people are, you know, I, I often look at this as almost like this canary in the mine. Um, you know, how do you treat the Indigenous people of the territory? It usually gives you a pretty good insight into what the overall structure is going to be when it comes to everybody else, when it comes to other oppressed demographics, you know, to other, um, you know, all the, all the isms that exist. Um, and so like, you know, you, you, we, we've got a situation in which the treaties that made the United States that ceded the territory to become what everyone currently lives on. I hope that every single person that's listening to this takes the time to learn whose land they're actually on. Um, if those people are still here, if they're not like what happened. Um, but in exchange for that, that, that those land sessions, certain guaranteed services were meant to be provided and that included education, healthcare, um, the right to basically live, you know, that we could hunt, fish, gather, do, do the things. And so you've got an, an Indian health service. It's a federally funded hospital service that serves all of Indian country. Before this pandemic started, we're talking less than like, you know, in some situations, less than two beds in an entire reservation, maybe not even, not even one hospital bed in an entire reservation serving all of those people, right? So with the Navajo Nation, you know, that is the most deaths and most hard hit per capita anywhere in the country. And partnering that with the knowledge that the native population has the lowest life expectancy of any US person, you know, that's the conditions you're walking into. 30% of that nation doesn't have running water. You know, they don't have electricity. Um, you know, as an experience on the ground, like I knew all of those statistics and, you know, it's something that we're supposed to rattle off whenever we get anyone to listen to the struggle of our people, but seeing it firsthand is a, is a whole other thing. I mean, you're walking into, you know, a, a territory where people are still living intergenerationally. So there's a house, there's a hogan there. That's a traditional living structure. There's another hogan. It's aunts, uncles, grandparents, children, families that are all living together. Um, not one of the 30 or so households with all those intergenerational folks that we served had not been touched by COVID-19 in one way or another, which meant that someone was currently sick or multiple someones, someone had recovered or someone had died, you know, or multiple someones had died. Um, you know, our collective is made up of indigenous peoples from all over the nation and just in our collective, you know, the, the folks that are from Navajo Nation, their, their family members are sick. Their family members are in the hospital. They've lost some. You know, I have a family member that just came down with COVID-19, not last week. Um, you know, the, the disparities that COVID has presented and really brought to the surface and to the forefront are something that we've been unable to turn away from. And when you partner that with the blatant murder of George Floyd for all of us to see and all of us watching for once, we were all watching. It wasn't just social justice advocates, it wasn't just black and brown folks, everyone was watching because everyone is hunkering down, right? And, and like focused on that and, and care. And you've got that racial justice piece for everyone to see, like, hey, this is happening. These are, the, these are existing conditions of our communities. These are not new issues. You have been killing us, whether it's in the streets or in subpar healthcare or in subpar education or in subpar access to economic development, whatever it may be, you have been like, this system is working exactly as it was built. It's working exactly as it was meant to function, just like you said at the beginning of this panel. Thank you so much for that, <clears throat> Tara. And because you were talking about water, I'm going to turn to you now, Sister Michelle, because I, I just remember the first time I met you, you know, I got like in my lift from the airport, you, you know, we met at this amazing center where we were doing some work. Uh, you, you were doing some work with, uh, uh, with Sawatu and introduced me to the community and then like kind of took me around. You took me to a local river. And now you, you, you said straight up, this is where the problem started and this is where it's going to have to end. Can you explain to the people what you meant by that, especially 
why it's critical for a zip code like the 48217, uh, Michigan's uh, most polluted zip code, in the context of climate justice of co um, and COVID and the overarching uh, context of preparedness and resilience. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the powerful words of my sisters in the struggle. Um, I think it's really important to remember that, you know, this didn't start with COVID. Um, this was, the conditions of this were set up by emergency manager, but it also didn't start there, right? We have a hundred years now under our belt of producing, manufacturing, uh, fossil fuel economy. We are the motor city. Um, we birthed uh, the automotive industry and the waste from 100 years of that is in the soil, it's in the air, it's in the water. And they are chemicals, they're forever chemicals that our waters and our lands have been receiving first and foremost. Um, the other than human beings who are living in those waters and who depend on them don't have a choice. Um, Many of our residents um, also don't have a choice about leaving what does make them resilient, right? And some people say, you should just leave, right? But that history also didn't start there. The conditions to set up the automotive industry were laid through the wasting of one of the most beautiful forests in the world, right? Um, so we have much of the climate crisis as we understand it today is because of carbon dioxide as it's been framed from fossil fuel industry, um, but colonial settlement in Michigan also meant uh, this, the total decimation of old growth forests and the ecologies that depended on them. Those are also pieces of resilience um, on Anishinaabe lands here uh, in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes is a place that holds 90% of the nation's surface fresh water. And we've been spoiling those waters that are so critical right now for many, many years. So to sit next to the water and see um, worm, you know, worm casings and, and fishing lines straddled across the river where just on the shore are 200 foot piles of uh, coal ash and pet coke and met coke um, industrial waste. Um, that is a, a very visceral um, and very direct line of chemicals straight from um, the legacy of what all of these industries has done to the land, air and water, right into our bodies, right into our wombs. And not just for one generation or two, but these are many generations now. And science is catching up with things that we've known for a long time, which is that, you know, being impacted by synergistic poisons for multiple generations um, without the ability to access clean, fresh water, clean, fresh food, uh, health care, kinship, quality education. Uh, jobs that pay living wages will make you more vulnerable. So we know that this is not just an equation of COVID, right? This is an equation of power. And when community comes together, we take back our power, right? And we did much of that during COVID through mutual aid, right? Delivering groceries to people who were afraid, literally, to leave their homes because ice is present on the most busy northern border uh, to Canada. Um, we know that people were taking on children, grandchildren of cousins or aunties or children because the child care system and the education system have both failed. And they are feeding now just not one or two mouths, but six, seven or eight mouths. You know, our our kinship ties are so much stronger than what the social safety net has been able to provide us in Detroit for decades. And that's why people of color know what it's like and know how to survive and know what situations and strengths that we have and how to implement them because that's what's kept us alive for so long.
Mm, thank you so much for that, Michelle. Um, Sister Jackie, a few years ago, um, um, NAACP in partnership with grassroots frontline organizations released the landmark cold-blooded report. Uh, I feel like every time I see you, I, I, I like reference something new that I've learned. Um, there is a very important finding, uh, quote, over a small number of coal plants, um, overall, a small number of coal plants have a disproportionately large and destructive effect on public health especially on the health of low-income people and people of color. I'm wondering how, if you can discuss how that statement and that report could almost be considered prescient as we find ourselves in this COVID moment. And, and um, if you could also elaborate on the fact that what many people don't know is that um, the Administrator Wheeler of the EPA has suspended since, uh, I believe, March or April, air quality reporting requirements of, of facilities. So how is this um, impacting our people, especially in the context of the uh, cold-blooded report? Thank you. Yeah, there are so many intersections with that statement. So um, one is, as I said before, that many of the same systemic inequities that uh, make communities of color and low-income communities more likely to be in harm's way as it relates to coal-fired power plants are the same systemic in inequities, whether it's redlining or under-regulation or, or other things that, so it mirrors the socio-political and economic underpinnings of the disproportionate vulnerabilities to COVID-19. Um, two is that uh, just a relatively small number of coal plants that are impacting many people, it only took a handful of people who are COVID-19 positive to have an outsized impact on the whole swath of our population. And again, because uh, our conditions, of the conditions of our, of our circumstances, whether it's our communities or otherwise, means that COVID-19 landed on very fertile ground in our bodies and in our communities. Um, three is that the uh, initiating problem of whether it's COVID-19 or even coal pollution have tremendous ripple effects, whether it's the economic crisis that we're seeing from COVID-19 or the fact that the pollution from coal-fired power plants not only harms public health to the detriment of communities, but also is a contributing factor to climate change, which comes back and harms the planet and also disproportionately harms those very same communities that are most impacted by coal pollution. And then also that we are once again the sacrifice zones in two different ways. One, we're sacrificed by being the underprotected essential frontline workers where our labor is seen as essential, but our actual lives are not. And um, secondly, that the rise in clarity around the disproportionate impact has an inverse relationship with the level of investment in solving the problem. So we see the same situation with coal-fired power plants. And as you talked about with Wheeler rolling back the regulations, it's because we're seen as, as, um, as sacrificial or as you know, not necessary as people, even though our labor is considered to be essential. And so our lives are being sacri sacrificed also for the political machinations of the powers that be once they recognize or, or who, who they think is, is disproportionately impacted. Another um, is the denying of science and turning issues of science and public health into political footballs. And we see that in both of the situations around regulations and now certainly around COVID-19. And then also that it didn't have to be this way. Both of these conditions are preventable pre or preventable if we had really dealt with the underlying conditions. And it doesn't have to be this way going forward. There's actions that we can take as it relates to coal pollution, climate change, and so forth. And there's actions that we can take as it relates to COVID-19. We just need to build up the political will to make it happen. And then also just that the solutions benefit us all that you know even though we're disproportionately impacted we're all impacted um, and so any solutions that we advance are for the betterment of, of our of, of us all thank you thank you sister jackie so um you know based on all of that um you know so this is a question to all of you and then i'm going to kind of break it down and have um, break, break you down into groups that have a quick conversation with each other but you know, and, and it's almost like as sadistic as this sound, but based on what you've all shared, is it safe to say that you're not surprised that the COVID pandemic is disproportionately impacting Black, Brown, and Indigenous folk? Why or why not? And um, could this also mean that how we address COVID and, and recover from COVID is a dress rehearsal for how we have to address and dismantle the climate crisis? I'll start with you, Tara. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely not surprised. And I would say like in terms of the climate crisis, this is a perfect example of, of what happens when the decision makers that 
you know, control a, control a large sum of resources and of policy and all these different things, choose to deny humanity, deny accountability, deny science, deny all of these different like pieces because they want to, I don't really know exactly what the angle was there. I guess like science is now just liberal. Like that's like the new MO of the, the Trump administration is like, any science is liberal. I'm like, okay, well, you're driving around in like all kinds of different technology and you're probably tweeting from a phone. Right? But anyway, like, so you're basically saying like that we're not going to follow that. It is so easily mirrored in climate crisis, right? Like, so climate crisis is disproportionately impacting black and brown people around the world. You go to the global South, they're already on water, underwater. They're already on fire. Western California is on fire, but I guess that's not enough because like we've been getting those for a while. So like people are okay with it, but it's like, no, it's creeping closer and closer and closer. It's just that mostly black and brown folks who don't speak English have been experiencing those problems, right, of climate crisis. And so with the pandemic, you know, it started, it's, it doesn't see color, right? It doesn't see race. However, it's disproportionately for sure impacted black and brown folks because of the existing infrastructure lack and like the existing care mechanisms. I mean, I know for, for our communities, the Trump administration actively tried to stop, like to carve out any monies for indigenous people specifically from the first CARES Act, specifically. He went after us individually and said, no, we won't pass it if there's, if there's funds for native tribes, you know? And then like made an allotance, okay, well you can do that, but there has to be like an, an, an inclusion of tribal corporations so give it to the Alaska Native Tribal Corporations that are, that are oil and gas. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's where we're at. And so those two things are so closely mirrored. And I would say that the human response to them is also spot on because it's like, this is right in front of me. So I'm going to react to this. And that's really far away. So I'm going to pretend like it's still, uh, that's a huge problem. And I'm not going to deal with it. Like it's, it's humans being human. Mm -hmm. Now, Miss Kathy, um, you know, that same question to you, I mean, you have this saying, and every, everybody who knows you and loves you like I do um, knows it, like, got to come down and see for yourself. Miss Kathy doesn't just let people hear or read about Lowndes County, and you're not going to roll with Miss Kathy and organize with the church until you come down. I, I, I've had the, the blessing of being able to go down there a few times. The first time, Miss Kathy, when you, you, you took me out and showed me the conditions, um, you, you must not be surprised, you know, at, at all. But you know, talking from the standpoint of wastewater and the fact that people were being impacted by hookworm thought to be eradicated in the 19th century, um, you, you must not be surprised and, and, and almost when you heard about this pandemic must have to some extent been anticipating it, no? Uh, d definitely, uh, I was anticipating it. And I guess I, one of the things I like to do is just give a little bit of a, uh, this is the history teacher in me. Uh, when you came down, and as you know, everybody comes down, learns about the role of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, in terms of Lowndes County's uh, history. And when students from around the country, led by Stokely Carmichael and others, actually came there and organized uh, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which was the original Black Panther Party. And the, uh, uh, the people were evicted from the property, those that were sharecroppers, because they wanted or had the desire to vote. Um, and all of this, I think, is, is intersectional and it shows the relationships. And, and I think things aren't, they didn't start yesterday. These are things that are systemic, that have lasted for a long time in places like Lowndes County, I think, where people dare to exercise their right to vote, were uh, uh, are victims of benign neglect in terms of not of making sure that they never got more than what it with what, what was needed to benefit a system that was put in place to enable slavery or free labor or next to free labor. So consequently, in Lowndes County and in other other Black Belt counties, you find a lot of areas that uh, never got wastewater infrastructure, or they have wastewater infrastructure that does not work. Uh, in the case of Pamela Rush, who just passed away a donor had come forward to, to purchase a home for her. Uh, and she never was able to move into that home because the septic system that we were told that she needed uh, cost $28,000. She was living off less than $1,000 a month. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it would need constant electricity. 
and this is a person who's already paying $300 of that less than $1,000 a month for power bills during the summertime. Uh, and, and, and basically what it does is set up people for, for not having good health and, and for not being able to be as productive as they can be, and not to mention the impact of children who are, who are living in those environments. And we often suspected that, that there was a re, there's, there was a, um, there was illness associated with it, and the parasite study proved that. We last summer we actually went and collected soil samples for, from a lot of places, and uh, the preliminary findings showed that uh, people were attracting were were, were attracting um, bacteria into their homes from where this wastewater was being you know dispersed out on, onto the ground. And then I wonder about those people that live like in some of these areas that are paying wastewater treatment fees where the system allowed them to get a failed uh, wastewater treatment system and it's coming back into their home. So they're getting, the, they're getting the wastewater from the whole town. And we know that COVID is shed in, in feces and wastewater. You can actually test the wastewater to determine the level, level of contagion before it starts showing up and people start getting sick. So, um, no, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised for numerous reasons. I'm not surprised because of the things that I've worked on, but I'm also not surprised because of the history, because I think if we look at the places that are being impacted the most, they have always had some type of uh, negligence when it came to policy to address, to give them what was needed or the infrastructure that was needed for people to experience the kind of equality or develop the type of economic system that they wanted in their communities. Whether it was Flint, whether it's Detroit, who's, who's suffering now from water shutoffs. Uh, because if you don't have water, you don't have sanitation. And, and one of the sustainable development goals uh, is the, the right, the human right to water and sanitation. So no, I'm, I'm not surprised. And, and I think that the way we deal with this in terms of climate justice, uh, one of the reasons why uh, the septic system was so expensive on the property that, that Pam owned, because when we went down 25 inches, we struck water. So what does that mean? That means with sea level rise, water tables are going to continue to rise. And as water tables continue to rise, the way we treat wastewater, period, is simply not going to work. So when we started talking about solutions, I mean, yeah, we're the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, but ultimately everybody who's dealing with 19th century technology is going to have problems because climate change is real and we have to change the way we address that. Thank you, Ms. Kathy. Um, now, um, Sisters Jackie and Michelle, because um, I know you're not surprised either, but the D in Baltimore, so many similarities between, you know, y'all cities, and, and we're not going to talk about the baseball or football teams because we're not going to go there, but um, both are traditional chocolate cities, growing immigrant populations, um, you know, um, in, in the D, um, an incredible Arab population, and, and of course, um, you know, our sister Rashida Talib, who um, recently won, is, is, is a, a perfect example of that. Both legacy environmental justice communities, and both inflicted, as Ms. Kathy just said, with an unchecked and unmitigated water crisis, and a lead crisis as well, that has existed in both your cities for, for a while. And now we have COVID. Um, I'm wondering what factors, though, in both of your cities allow these crises to remain, allow them to begin, and you know, what is happening and what isn't happening in, in, with, with respect to perpetuating these crises. I will start with um, uh, you, Michelle. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm just waiting for my kids as I hear them coming up the stairs to try to interrupt our webinar. So I might turn off my uh, Zoom call here in a second, you know, but you know, the thing that I, that I hear that a lot of people um, don't know still about the Detroit metro areas that we are still um, the most segregated metropolitan uh, in the United States. And I think Detroit competes with Chicago in the worst kind of competition that you could ever engage in, right? Um, you know, the historic segregation, the redlining, uh, the inaccessibility to jobs, banking, the structural and systemic racism that has just been baked into the system in Detroit absolutely is at the center of this crisis, right? And I say from the climate justice perspective that 
any climate justice activist who's been in the trenches and doing this work had an incredible psychological blip in the matrix because it was a moment where everybody said, I knew this was going to come to pass. I just didn't know how or when, right? Because we steep ourselves in all of this information about rising tide and increases in infectious diseases. We know the structural inequities. We have water warriors here in the city of Detroit who have already determined that hepatitis A is associated with the lack of water here in Detroit. Um, and then COVID comes and we find the same thing. What we saw in early maps in the COVID crisis was that there was a big, huge vacant spot in the COVID diagnosis map within the Latino community. We said, well, yeah, <laughs> that's because nobody's going to get tested because they're worried that ICE is gonna pick them up and deport them to a country they might not even be from, right? So we are absolutely um, bracing for this as a harbinger of what we can expect both in higher frequency and bigger magnitude in the future. And I know the conditions in Baltimore may be similar because it is about power. It is about the power equation. And when we had a radical right-wing agenda being forced onto the Michigan books over the last decade through Governor Snyder, who f people famously know for it, the Flint water crisis, yeah. we also yeah, had I, things so, like the... Um, Hi, I think we can get that webinar. fixed pretty easy. Let me... Uh, there's, excuse me, sir. I, I, I think thing you're... that I was about sir? to... Fixed, so he can't hear us. He can't hear him. Oh, he can't hear us. Okay, thank you so much. This is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if our host can get yeah. uh, word to the other host that um, he's on our <laughs> webinar, but um, yay, virtual net roots. Talk about a blip in the matrix. <laughs> anyway, Hello. So yeah, yeah no, I mean, <laughs> as I was saying, you know, I mean, it's like, it's an equation of power, right? And so it's just wild for us to be thinking about the context of, you know, our schools being disinvested, our, our water system being regionalized, our trash being privatized, our lighting department being privatized, and all of these things, right? The project of neoliberalism was started with capital flight in the, in the mid-50s, bankrupt our city. And it totally left us without the things that we needed, the social safety nets that we've been fighting tooth and nail uh, for the last generations to, to hold on to, now are visible, right, to so many more Americans. Um, and that, that is the moment to say, you know, we haven't been making it up. We're, we're engaging in a societal gaslighting um, and we're here and we're real and this is happening. Sister Jackie, um, you know, because also, right, I mean, um, and, um, you know, Baltimore also has this uh, legacy, of course, of unfortunately bad local lawmakers as well. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if you can speak to that, because if I'm not mistaken, there, because we, we do need to talk about people who are displaced as well. Baltimore has 16,000 to 20,000 just vacant, you know, buildings and lots and whatnot. So I would love for you to, um, you know, compound on those similarities that Sister Michelle started. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, most recently I was looking to, I, I was, well, I'll start with when I first came to Baltimore, I was going to school and I started to work for the Baltimore Fetal and Infant Mortality Review Project, where I actually interviewed women who had lost their, their babies. And uh, there is a high rate of infant mortality and maternal mortality among um, Black women and Black families. And in, in having those conversations with women, they talked about the stresses of their daily lives, whether they directly attributed it to racism or they attributed it to, to not being able to find a job, not being able to provide for their children. They talked about the, the crime issues in their area. They talked about their housing insecurity. So many of them were transient and living with other, other people. I was also at the same time working on a project where we did uh, it was a, a, a review of, of uh, neighborhood residents on, um, on ch early childhood development. And similarly, we, we, we actually cataloged how many vacant houses were in a community, how many, it was, it was during that time that there, there was a study called, it was like the broken window study and really talked about how these neighborhood factors, yeah. And so, and, and really we're able to draw those same findings in the, in the in hyper segregated black low income communities where the, the disinvestment was just right. Fast forward to 
recently looking at the housing market here, it's interesting to see both the, the, the blight, the extreme blight in certain areas, and also now this, this, the coming of gentrification, these $5 homes, I know that, yeah, where, um, and, and people buying those homes and flipping them. And so where you, and we, where you see like policies that are supposed to help like the opportunity zones, they really end up being just a windfall for developers. And we're seeing that in real time in Baltimore for sure. But then at the same time, just like the, the, the zero waste Detroit folks, we have folks like the, um, the Curtis Bay um, and and um, and Destiny Watford, who who really fought and, and was successful in fighting off an incinerator there. So those are also commonalities in terms of the rising resistance and its success. And so that is um, I'll end on that positive note. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, and then I'll kick it to uh, you, Tara, Miss Kathy. So many parallels that are clearly elucidated in both the rural Black community and uh, so-called Indian country. I'm wondering if y'all can speak to these parallels. Um, you know, we've touched on it, you know, um, uh, with, with COVID, but, you know, some of the existing inju injustices and, and some of the similarities that you, you've seen in, in both of your travels between, you know, in Indian country and rural Black communities. We'll start with you, Tara, and then we'll, then we'll go to uh, Ms. Kathy. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm born and raised in a small town in northern Minnesota. I grew up with, in a town of like 200 people outside of bursting metropolis of 6,000. You know, like it's, I grew up in a, in a rural community and, you know, have proceeded to work in Indian country, which oftentimes is rural communities, but also oftentimes can be urban communities. There's a lot of natives that live off res. But when it comes to extractive industry, when it comes to, um, you know, extreme lack of economic development and access and, those issues that plague us, the parallels are so obvious. So, you know, we're the communities that have to bear the brunt of new fossil fuel infrastructure. We're the communities that are told that we're gonna bear the brunt of your choices, either get the job working on the oil rig, get the job pulling the ore out of the ground, get the job, you know, cutting down the forest, or you're not gonna have a job because we're not gonna invest in your community. We're not gonna invest in rural areas. We're not gonna invest in um, Indian country, you know, that's, that's kind of like what we run into again and again, that's at a state and a federal level. Um, you know, I mean, you're essentially given the choice of screw up the land that your, your, your children uh, live on, mess up the waters that you drink, that everyone downstream <laughs> drinks, but doesn't think about, um, because that's the cost of you being from this place. That's just, to me, when we're talking about you know, even, even in, uh, you know, more mainstream NGO spaces of conservation instead of stewardship or whatever it happens to be, how do you look to the places where that's, it's still remaining, the, it's still beautiful, it still has, you know, healthy trees, healthy forests, healthy lands, healthy prairies, and decide like, hey, that's, well, we haven't screwed this up yet, so let's go in and, and do it here, because the, the city can't see it from here. You know, I mean, it's essentially out of sight, out of mind. And that's been the attitude towards Indian country. That's been the attitude towards black and brown folks, even within large metropolitan areas and in, in, you know, like the suburbs, if they're black and brown suburbs, out of sight, out of mind, we can't see you. It, it you know, we'll, we'll continue to do business as usual. And, and Ms. Kathy, I mean, you know, you, you've always said, you know, from the onset, um, you know, you, you hosted uh, Senator Sanders when he, he came down to Lowndes County. Um, I, I know for a fact, and, um, you know, speaking uh, with his environmental uh, policy director, big shout out to our sister, uh, Katie Thomas, that he was, he was very moved. He, he was very, very moved. You also, uh, we, we, <laughs> we met at Standing Rock, actually, um, um, thank goodness. Um, and, and you were, you were, you, you were, you were like, it's, I'm, I'm seeing the same things. It, I'm, I'm wondering if you, you could build off of that um, a, a, bit, a bit more as well. Because what I'm trying to do these parallels is also to get to finally we'll, we'll get to the solutions in, in the next part of our discussion. Well, I think first of all, and I need to share that um, if we go back and look at the history of Lowndes County, it was also the location of what was called Holy Ground, uh, and Holy Ground was the area where a lot of um, where where one of the the battles of the so-called Creek Wars was fought, and a lot of us have. Muscogee blood in us because there were Muscogees and African Americans that were living together. And some of them, including some of my relatives, were on the Trail of Tears. And when I went to Standing Rock 
and I was listening to uh, when we were standing, if you remember the campfire being the center of the camp, and in the evenings, a lot of people would gather around the campfire. And one night when I was at the campfire and people were singing, and I guess they were singing in Sioux, but it sounded almost like I understood what they were saying because it sounded like a spiritual moan to me. And it made me wonder, you know, was there some kind of interaction there between um, uh, Africans who were uh, uh, living with indi among the indigenous peoples of, of the Americas or people, or, or was there just something else that was much bigger than we even realized? I think that's how we have these, these big questions and find these answers. But, uh, but Holy Ground is very much a part of, of, uh, of who I am. And we did a ceremony there um, when we did our first climate training in Lowndes County. I think Jackie was there. She, did, she, she may not have been at the ceremony, but she was at the climate training. Jackie's been everywhere. Actually, Jackie was the reason I was at COP21. But anyway, going back uh, to, to, um, to Holy Ground that day, when we did the, um, when the ceremony was being performed, we stood in a circle and we were on the Alabama River. And at that particular time, I, uh, we were told to pick up the soil and have it in our hands. And as part of that ceremony, I started to feel the soil move in my hands. And I didn't realize, you know, what that meant at the time. But during the ceremony, we started to hear the fish literally jump out of the river I could hear the birds, the birds over us started singing. It was just something spiritual about that experience. But there's always, and I'm saying all this to say about the intersection and the commonalities between our histories uh, in terms of our indigenous, the brothers and sisters that are indigenous to this land and the relationships that we have that we need to acknowledge a little bit more than we do. And even going in, if we look at the 60s uh, in Lowndes County, People from the American Indian Movement came to Lowndes County. People like Dennis Banks and Russell Means were in Lowndes County coalescing with the Lowndes County Freedom Organizations and members of the, um, the original Black Panther Party that were there and continued to have a relationship. So the, in terms of the, um, the similarities that exist, yes, we're fighting the same enemy. <laughs> and, and we have been dealing with the same type of oppression. And I think that the way we're going to overcome this is to work together to find ways. That's why it was important for me to be at Standing Rock. You know, it's important for me to, to, to it was important for me to go to Louisiana, you know, to be there and to see firsthand what was happening in Louisiana because uh, we've had a number of visitors in recent times who've actually come, actually, I've been doing this work for 18 years. And over the course of those 18 years, I've had indigenous brothers and sisters to visit because they heard about Lowndes County. And what they told me when they came away is that it reminded them of the reservation. So we're on a reservation too. <laughs> it's a, we don't call it a reservation, but we're treated the same and we were never given any kind of sovereignty. But I, I think in terms of finding solutions that are more inclusive, uh, that does not rule out uh, access to, to, to funding, and the policies are written in such a way that oftentimes it's fluid rural communities. We've got to address those issues. And I'll, I'll hold on to that because that's part of the solution. That's right. No, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kebby. We, we are going to move to the, the solutions talk. I'm going to come back to you real quickly, uh, Tara, because uh, Ms. Kathy bro uh, um, brought up this idea of intersectionality. Um, after George Floyd's lynching, um, you invited me up to present day uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, to bear witness, offer support, um, and, and, and to you know, just stand in solidarity. Since that time, Tara, we've seen some endpoints to some of your work, including Not My Mascot. We got the news that the um, NFL franchise from Washington, D.C is of course changing their name. You saw some other things. And when um, I reported the news to you, um, the first thing you said back to me was, thank you, George Floyd. Can you explain what you meant by that? Um, you know, uh, and, and how you, the, the connections between the NFL franchise in Washington changing their name and, 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 and George Floyd's lynching. So the debt that we all Oh, to George Floyd can never be repaid. Um, you know, it's. I think the ripples of of the the theft of his life are continuing even now. Um, you know, whether it's discussions of 
racial justice or, you know, the, the, the intersectionality of, of race into so many aspects of American life, but also life more broadly. Like, I think that's, it's something that has really um, just kind of forced it right into the crosshairs where we can't look away. Um, and that means something like the Washington football team, which is so obviously racist and has been fought tooth and nail by native people for 60 years. Yeah. Instant in an instant. All it took was like the sponsors being like, okay, we don't want to be associated with this anymore. We're, we're trying, racism isn't cool anymore, or at least it's not cool enough that we can like tacitly endorse it. So we're pulling out, you know what I mean? That's what it took. It took people marching in the streets. It took cities burning. It took people, you know, being incarcerated. Some people were killed, you know, I mean, this, this, this civil unrest, this, this boiling point of, um, just the, the blatant murder of, of someone in the streets. And for me, it was, it was so close to home. I mean, I lived in Minneapolis during school. It's, you know, it's a place that I I'm very familiar with, you know, my, my teacher is actually uh, my, my spiritual teacher and, and traditional language speaker um, lives right around the block from where he was, where he was killed. Um, you know, the intersectionality of black and, and indigenous struggle is something that I saw at Standing Rock and I've seen in small iterations but i also understand there there is this legacy of black panthers and and american Indian movement and there is this kind of like sense that we need to come together in ways that are not just inviting each other to each other's events but like actually showing the intersectionality of these two um struggles for liberation you know that that reparations and land back are actually two concepts that need to be tied together that we're talking about the theft of labor, we're talking about the theft of land. Those are, those, without those things, the United States would have never happened, you know, without that reality and without that harm that continues in those communities. Um, and I think that there is a growing sense among young people, especially that these, these connections need to be solidified in real ways. Um, you know, going down to Minneapolis and standing, go where you're tell us where to stand tell us what to do like that's what that's what i went there to do black folks want me to stand here they want me to sit here i'll do it you know what i mean i also came to help cook and feed people you know this this massive house houseless population that's also can't look away from that either people are living in tents all over the place and it wasn't just because of covid it was already happening before that um you know our, our struggles are are so intimately tied together and i think that you know, the coming together of our, our people is something that there's no way that that doesn't benefit both of our, our resistance struggles. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, Michelle and uh, 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 Jackie, um, if, and when we're talking about this, this issue of, of solutions, um, I'm wondering if y'all can also, be, you know, a, a lot of the times, and unfortunately we, we've seen a lot of this with the mainstream greens, the big greens, et cetera, et cetera. It's just like this idea of policy, policy, policy. But can y'all, can y'all talk about, especially the solutions that, you know, we're talking about, whether it is the amazing work that the New York Renews Coalition did, uh, uh, Big up to Up Rose and Elizabeth, um, Eddie and, and Rawa from, from Push Buffalo, um, the amazing work that um, Asian Pacific Environmental Network did with AB 857 public banking. Um, big up to, to Mia and Sylvia Chi in California. But um, there's never, it just seems like people think that these solutions just spawn up, but like they don't talk about the organizing. And all of us, all four of you sisters, like come from a tradition of very, very like robust and, and necessary organizing. Can you talk about how there, there can't be policy with, with, without organizing? There can't be just transition, just recovery, energy, democracy, food sovereignty. So um, I'll kick to you first, Jackie, and then let um, uh, Michelle uh, bring it up after you. But can we even have policy without organizing? Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> so we've seen, as you've given some of the examples of the great policy that has resulted from organizing, and we can also think of just as many examples of the policies that have failed because they've been absent the organizing. So um, whether it is the, the Portland Clean Energy Fund and really how the frontline people of color push forward in, in leading on that, even though and, 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 and the success that we saw there that would not have happened. And we know the failure of the, of the um, 
the what do you call it? the Waxman Markey bill, the the failed uh, failure of the notion of comprehensive climate legislation, which at its core was again was everything that we as frontline communities are against <laughs> in terms of cap and trade. And so each of it was each of the examples of the successes you can you can uh, you can um, tie the ex examples of failure to to the lack of frontline community leadership. And so it really it actually, so by definition, the types of policies that are moving forward are ones that, that, that recognize that intersectionality and that ensure that it's not just people organizing, but it also is that because the people are organizing together, then the content of, of, of these policies are comprehensive, intersectional with the inextricable rights to labor rights, indigenous rights uh, are all in these comprehensive policies because of who's at the table. So, yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sister Jackie. And, and you know, just to preface it with uh, you, Michelle, right? So as you know, um, you're a CJA member. Um, you know, we are part of a, uh, a 14 organization coalition called the Green New Deal uh, Network Coordinating Team. Um, we are uh, soon about to um, uh, uh, present an agenda called the Thrive Agenda, uh, Transform, Heal, Renew in, uh, by Investing in Vibrant Economies. But if we don't have organizing, is it like, is it just like a really nice word? And, and especially in the context of Detroit, I mean, Detroit is like organizing central. How, how important is it, you know, to, to and, and what do we have to do in orders, especially so that these solutions are, are real, especially the solutions that are coming from front lines? Uh, you're muted, sis. You're, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. You know, the first thing I want to say first and foremost is that, you know, racial oppression and systemic oppression is an abstract concept isn't of itself a virus. We have to stop saying, oh, that's such a tragedy. What poor people. I feel so sad for this situation. Our country is terrible. I'm glad that you feel that way. Now we need real policies. We need real changes. We need those who are capturing power and maintaining power to be named publicly, right? We need these situations that have been consequential of hundreds of years of oppression to be stopped. And we need direct investment to start repairing our communities and making our communities whole in the ways, <clears throat> excuse me, in the ways that community are asking for it, right? Now, the way that I was educated about climate Carbon fundamentalism was the primary framework through which all climate problems would be solved. If we reduce CO2, if we reduce methane, if we reduce greenhouse gases, then we'll be saved. No, that's not true. And if that is the dominant narrative that's continuing to happen in your organization, in your community group, in your policy rooms that are happening at multiple different levels throughout the organizations, and concentrated in Washington DC in closed door chambers, then you need to disrupt that space and say, why aren't there any environmental justice communities in this room today right now? Those are the kinds of complicit relationships that we need to be building the kind of solutions for survival for many, many different types of people who are in much, much different situations but have been similarly oppressed, right? So, the solutions, right, that have been put forward are about community direct investment, right? I can tell you very clearly that since the March in July that happened um, in front of the Democratic National Convention, we've had the collapse of the Detroit Riverfront, which houses historic uranium from the Manhattan Project. We've had a facility fire at Marathon Oil. We've had an expansion, a 10 times expansion of a hazardous waste facility on Detroit's east side. We've had an expansion of air quality permits for our automotive industries and our steel industries who have been in violation of clean, the Clean Air Act for decades. So these things to, to treat racial oppression as an abstraction and then on the other hand, not being able to articulate and identify the harms that continue to happen are creating a disjuncture and a discord inside of the climate movement. We need more people who are complicit in our co-liberation so that we can create more survivances for life on earth for the next generations. And I think that's the pointedness of the intersectionality. That's the pointedness of being a comrade in the struggle. So mm. 
Mm, that's, that's heavy. So I want to take it, to, turn it to you uh, quickly, Miss Kathy, because Michelle hit something like, like, like it was really important. She said the way communities want it, community direct investment. Um, as, as you know, um, shortly after after meeting you coming down to Lowndes County, I, I picked up, and it's not representative Hakeem Jeffries. We, we got, <laughs> it's Hakeem Jeffries is a different Hakeem Jeffries who wrote uh, Bloody Lounge. Um, and, um, and and something you said to me, you know, in, in talking about like how that community created a lot of this kind of freedom organization, you said, um, I remember this, um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, you just need the appropriate tires. And and, and, and I love that. And using Lounge kind of freedom organization as an example. Can you can you um, elaborate on, you know, how that local power, you know, and, and maybe it's a little bit historical and, and how it does apply to today based on everything that we've been hearing from Tara, Jackie and, and Michelle as it pertains to the solutions. Well, uh, I, I think it's probably being the senior person on this panel, um, it, it's kind of hard for me not to look at history and, and, and draw some connections here. Uh, for an example, uh, even Detroit, you know, we talked about uh, when people registered to vote in Lowndes County and they were kicked off the properties, they ended up living in Tent City. The tent poles were brought by people that were living in Detroit because, you know, Detroit was part of the Great Migration. And when people left the South, they went to Detroit. So a lot of people in Detroit were organizing, uh, organizing and helping, there's that word again, organizing. They were helping and they were in coalition with the people that were in Lowndes County and gave them a lot of the support. Uh, there's a woman there, Dorothy Dewberry, you know, she's worthy of going to listen to talk to Dorothy to talk about that history because Dorothy was very involved uh, she's an elder. But she was very involved in what was happening between Lowndes County and Detroit. So uh, when I went to Detroit, actually I was teaching at Renaissance High School, so I have a lot of history in Detroit because it's part of the migration. A lot of my family went to Detroit and they were, um, uh, uh, during that time Hassan was writing Bloody Lowndes and uh, Taylor Branch was writing at Canner's Edge. And Taylor Branch and Hassan Jeffries both went to Detroit and I was there and, and had the opportunity to go with them and actually hear firsthand stories of why people fled places like Lowndes County. Uh, one of the persons that I met, um, his last name was Simpson, I remember, and he was, uh, his, actually his son was Donnie Simpson. I didn't know that Donnie Simpson, I knew he was from Detroit, but I didn't know about the connection to Lowndes County and his father left Lowndes County because the cousin had been lynched and they threw his body on the porch so that the people would know that they could not work. The cousin was supposed to be joining the military the next day, but they used a lot of the racial terror to keep control of the labor. So Hassan in his book um, captured that quite well. And Hassan, by the way, is the representative's twin brother. <laughs> so uh, Representative Jeffrey's twin brother. But I think that those organizing is very important. Organizing, uh, developing partnerships and coalescing. And sometimes we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already been done. We just have to go and connect it and work together. And I, I feel that um, that's why I go to Detroit. You know, I, I, I know, you know, the folk there with um, We the People Detroit and the, the New Poor People's Campaign there in Detroit. Uh, I've been to Flint, you know, I had the opportunity to go there and actually see and see how they poisoned the Flint River, you know, and how a lot of the people that are, uh, and they're even trying to gentrify Flint for that matter. So I, I think that we, we have to, I think we should spend more time, part of the solution is spend more time visiting each other. I mean, one of the first persons to come and visit Lowndes County was Jackie Patterson. I just remember uh, in, in um, we had a march about immigration. It was an immigration law that, that ended up being kind of the pilot for what they did across the country. But uh, when they passed that law in Alabama, they had a, a march from Selma to Montgomery. And as a result, uh, I ended up meeting the person then who was the head of the NAACP and the regional director for the NAACP, Kevin Miles, who brought Jackie Patterson to Lowndes County, who got a chance to see firsthand before anybody else even saw what was happening with the wastewater problem. I got to give it to the system because it's people like that that give us strength when we're out there doing it and nobody's paying us any attention. And now all of a sudden, 
you know, people are starting to see what we've been talking about for years. So I think part of the solution is working together, having these collaborations, finding ways in which we can be supportive of each other. And if I have resources, I'm willing to share my resources and, and, and network to, to, to uplift and lift up the voices of people in other areas. There's a place called Centerville, uh, Illinois, right now, which, is, which has more raw sewage on the ground than I've seen in Lowndes County. And I'm using my voice to lift that up because that needs to change. And that's up north. People just think that it's always, it's just all the worst of it is in the south or in Flint or in Detroit, but it's also in other places throughout the United States. And the way we find the solutions by lifting, them, lifting it up and being, in, and being at the table when it comes to writing these policies to make sure that they address our issues too. We cannot rely on just the politicians because in a lot of cases, they do not represent us. They represent the people that put money into their campaigns, not the people that voted for them. And, and it should be the other way around. That's right. <clears throat> well, um, uh, since you were named job sister Jackie and you have been everywhere, you are, you are known as Jackie the Jet Setter. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can, <laughs> if you can elaborate on what Miss Kathy said, because yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I love when I bump into you. Um, it's including Standing Rock, by the way. This this idea of like going to these different areas, um, and and why that's so important as we're trying to scale up and scale out solutions. Before you answer that, I, I just want to say that we have uh, ten more minutes left. I have one more question for Tara after this, and then uh, someone put a question in the chat, and then that'll probably uh, take us to time. So, floor is yours, Sister Jackie. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the best part of, of that kind of going from place to place has been being able to lift up one place based on the experience of the last place. Because as I go to, as I go, as I went to East Chicago, Indiana, for example, where they had uh, arsenic and lead in their soil and they were being displaced as a result, we were able to take the learnings from having done the 20 point plan in Flint to then have the conversation with East Chicago about how do they want to put together a consensus plan about to really demand what they want from the powers that be. And then, and so, and so on and so on. Now we just, speaking of kind of Centerville, Illinois and other places, I was just brought to my attention this place called Sand Branch, Texas which is right outside of Dallas, which does not have running water. And they, not just now, they don't have the pipes. So they've never had, it's a community that used to be all black. I mean, there is all black community, 500, used to be 500 people, now 100 people. And so now really sitting down with them and figuring out how do we develop this infrastructure. And, but, it, but, but based on the learnings of the or, great organizing that's done in other places, I can now take those learnings to there and say, here's, so, and, then, and then sometimes even, even physically connecting community to community so that they can really share practices and, and build solidarity and, and, uh, and, and really learn from each other's organizing um, successes. So, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, quickly, Sister Tara, um, you're obviously one of the more brilliant policy people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. You have a law degree with all these funny Latin names after them, some of Magna, whatever, um, Bernie advisor in 2016, so in the same extent in 20, some extent in 2020, you're in the woods now, defending land, water, and climate from this pipeline. Um, have you given up on policy, or is it more that policy alone will not deliver the mechanisms to keep our people and planet safe? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think that when it comes to trying to hold back the crisis that is ongoing, the ship that is on fire all over the place in all kinds of different aspects, um, that we have to obviously do our best to try to plug every single hole that we possibly can, which means policy, it means divestment, it means front lines, it means, you know, demonstrations, it means public pressure, all, all the different pieces that you, that we have in our, in our toolkits to try to, to try to stop at least the expansion of, um, this oppressive force. But I would say, you know, in my experience of, of observing kind of what has happened, and I think if anything that the George Floyd demonstrations reflect what I've come to, which is there is no substitution for direct action. There is no substitution for people that are willing to risk their freedom to push for change, hands down. So I guess I haven't given up on policy, but I would say that I do not think that we are going to address climate crisis comfortably. I don't think that we are going to stop or it even slow down 
climate crisis by solar paneling and wind turbining our way out of it, like that's not going to happen. We need radical change and we need more people who are willing to actually take a stand with the earth. We need more people who are willing to um, consume less, which obviously I think that, you know, there's a, there's a big discrepancy in who's consuming the most, who's causing the most um, damages. But at the same time, like we also play a role in consumerism. We play a role in looking at our own food systems and looking at, you know what, here's the COVID pandemic reminding us that if food distribution networks break down, where am I going to get a meal? Where do I know how to grow food? Is there a community garden in the area? Is there any access to space to actually grow food and, and gain that, that independence or even the semblance of that independence, the beginnings of it? How do I nurture and build that relationship? Um, I think human beings as a species have a, have a lot of work to do when it comes to reconnecting to the earth in a real way, in a substantive way, in a way that is in our every single day lives. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of heavy lift that I think so many of us need to do um, if we're going to, if we're going to address the problem. Thank you, sis. Um, so um, this will be our last question. I'll pose it to all of you. We'll start with Michelle. But um, one of the uh, people in the virtual audience um, asked to uh, please um, ask how we unify preparing for disaster messaging across the uh, movement for black lives. I, I think he means Medicare or they, uh, Harry means Medicare for all and climate organization. So how do we prepare our disaster messaging across those um, different avenues? We'll start with you, Michelle. And we'll have to be like a minute each before or we're gonna get, uh, you know, the Apollo yeah. thing where we get thrown off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, try to avoid the hook. I am not, disclaimer, a, a PR marketing uh, firm executive or anywhere near that. Um, but I know um, being in the trenches and, and being a part of a, a loving family and community that um, talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius by da 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 2030, uh, cutting carbon, da da da, nobody, no, sorry, bye, stop, now, right? <laughs> um, you know, what, what I say is that, you know, do you, do you feel cared for right now, <laughs> you know? Let's start, you know, asking, are, are your neighbors feeling cared for and what would it take for our communities and society to feel cared for? Now add a superstorm, a mass power outage, a community flooding, a failed dam. How do we care for our communities in a disaster? When people start saying, oh, damn, well, I would need health care. It's like, that's why we need health care for everybody, right? So really starting with our lives and our experiences has been such a huge uh, decolonizing moment <laughs> for me in, in undoing some of the ways that our education has told us, right? Yeah, we're not dead bots. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Ms. Kathy, as our, our, our matriarch and our elder, you get the, the last word on this question and then I'm, I'm gonna uh, close it up um, because I have to like say uh, all the thanks and all that stuff and get teary eyed and all that good stuff. So last word to you on that question. Um, and actually I wrote my answer, which is I think the best way to unify the message is to lift up the stories of impacted people. Um, I think and oftentimes we, we make it so abstract and. And one of the problems that I had with the messaging around climate change was that it focused just on, you know, the symbol became the polar bear. But the symbol should also be the people that are impacted by this, because at the end of the day, that's what resonate and what that's what people remember and recall. So, um, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you, Ms. Kathy. You're reminding me of a phrase I coined at Netroots, actually, which was, Polar bears may be white, but they can't vote. Um, <laughs> um, that said, everybody, thank you so much for watching. This will be available um, on uh, Netroots' YouTube page um, either later today or certainly by tomorrow. I have to thank my panelists, Tara Hauska, Michelle Martinez, Jackie Patterson, uh, Miss Kathy Coleman Flowers. I love all of you so much. Tara, I'm coming to camp soon. Don't know when I'm going to be in Baltimore next, uh, uh, Sister Jackie. Don't know where I'm going to be in the D next. Please send all my love to our people in the D. And Ms. Kathy, always with you in struggle. I love all of you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mary Rickles from uh, Netroots Nation for helping to put all of this together. We love you so much, Mary. And we know that you're, you're just trying to catch your breath right now. And I made it without saying any curse words, Mary. So you can let out a sigh of relief. <laughs> Peace, everybody. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.